everyone, uh, again, welcome you. It's Friday morning, so it's a very, very special uh, day for us to uh, enjoy science, uh, not only doing science, but listen to uh, top leaders in our field, and today is not exception. So uh, again, have a wonderful time with our speaker, torture him with good questions at the end. And with that, I will uh, ask Krafal to come over here. My name is Rafał Kowowicz, and I am a postdoctoral researcher in Krzysztof Kowalczewski Lab. It's my great pleasure to introduce our special guest, Dr. Douglas Edward Porra, Associate Professor of Genetics and Ophthalmology from the University of Stanford. <coughs> Dr. Walrath received his Bachelor of Science degree in Biochemistry from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1981, and an MD, PhD in Biochemistry from Stanford University in 1989. After a postdoctoral fellowship in the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in 1993, he was appointed as an assistant professor in the Department of Genetics, University of Stanford, and was promoted to an associate professor in the year 2000. Since 2004, he is also an associate professor in the Department of Ophthalmology, University of Stanford. Dr. Volrad has made enormous contributions to studies of genetics of human vision pathologies which helped to understand mechanisms of neopatella syndrome, retinitis pigmentosa, ophthalmic glaucoma, and others. As we heard last week during Dr. Raquel Lieberman's talk, Dr. Holland's research helped to understand the mechanisms of secretion and misfolding of myosilin, and uh, together they demonstrated a potential to rescue the diseased phenotype using chemical chaperones. Recently, Dr. Volrad led a study of pathogenesis of age-related macular degeneration using primary human RPE cells, which provided important insights into the resistance of healthy RPE cells against toxicity of lipotoxins. Dr. Volrad also recently established a mouse line with RPE-specific recombinase activity, which allows to study gene functions specifically in the RPE. This is a very selective model. I was really um, blown away by the results. Dr. Volrath received numerous grants which were funded by NIH, Foundation Fighting Blindness, the Glaucoma Foundation, and others. In 2017, he was awarded Foundation Fighting Blindness Individual Investigator Award to study MERTK associated photoreceptor degeneration. Dr. Volrath served as an editor and reviewer of many scientific journals, for example, Nature Genetics, PNAS, and Science Signaling. Uh, he was a member of many advisory committees, and since 2009, he is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Foundation Fighting Blindness. He mentored numerous young scientists, including undergraduate students, PhD students, and postdocs. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Douglas Walrath, who will talk about assisted living in the outer retina. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm sharing my screen and to center. Okay, are we good? Can everyone see? Yes. All right, so thank you again. I'm really pleased to uh, be able to speak in this uh, seminar series. I think forums like this are one of the few positive outcomes of the uh, pandemic. We are able to share in ways that we, we, we didn't before. So today, to give a little bit more um, specificity to my general title, I'm gonna talk about re uh, so briefly about our RP modifier work and then discuss in more detail how it motivated a larger search for EQTLs in the RPE and the implications of those findings for uh, ocular diseases. And for those of you who, assuming that uh, everything goes as expected, I'll add a little coda at the end. So, so don't, uh, don't log off or leave the room quite too fast. Um, so <clears throat> we are interested in cell interactions in the outer retina, um, primarily between the photoreceptors and retinal pigment epithelium. And these two cell types have been cooperating for a half a billion years 
in uh, as partners in vision and a, their functions have evolved and interactions have evolved to the point where in the mammalian retina they're intimately associated and they cooperate in, uh, in, in a number of ways, so hence the assisted living theme. Um, and we've studied a couple of those, those interactions, specifically the phagocytosis of outer segment tips um, by the RPE to support regeneration of the outer segments and also uh, metabolic interactions between the RPE and photoreceptors and the uh, effect of metabolic perturbations on the RPE, on the RPE's phenotype, and also on uh, the consequences of, of those perturbations for photoreceptors. So um, we use naturally occurring mutations and variants, as well as induced mutations in mice in order to try to understand basic homeostatic mechanisms and how those mechanisms are perturbed in uh, diseases, photoreceptor degeneration, such as retinitis pigmentosa and age-related macular degeneration. And that also uh, has a theme of, of assisted living. So a long time ago now, we, identified, we probed the, the mechanism of R RPE phagocytosis of outer segments by identifying the gene that was responsible for the phagocytic defect in the RCS rat. And then we went on to identify mutations in humans with uh, in MERTK that had retinitis pigmentosa and defined the RP38 locus, and then studied knockout mice that were generated by Glenn Matsushima and found a very similar phenotype to the RCS rat. And this work uh, showed that MERTK is essential for retinal homeostasis in three mammals, and we assume in, in all um, mammals, and, uh, and, and established a connection between the TAM family of our receptor tyrosine kinases and the phagocytic process, which was the first connection. And it's that, that theme's now been elaborated in um, multiple other tissues and cell types. So the, the mouse, that we studied initially was uh, on a mixed background. It had a very rapid degeneration similar to the RCS rat. And being good geneticists, we wanted to clean up this background and um, put it on a, on a C57 black background, which is more standard. And so we did multiple back cross generations, always as uh, just selecting um, for the uh, knockout allele and, uh, and always as heterozygotes and never looking at the phenotype. And then after about six back cross generations, we, we said, okay, let's look at the phenotype and intercrossed and made homozygotes and sent eyes up to um, the Laveo lab that we collaborated with and, and generated this beautiful histology. And at that time, most of the eyes, we saw a pan retinal degeneration, but it was slower than the one that we'd originally identified. And that's not too surprising when you, uh, transfer an allele onto a different background. But what was surprising was that a minority of the uh, sections looked like this. And I still remember the day when I got the call from the late Doug Yasamura, who has worked in Matt's lab for many years. And he said, Doug, you sent us some wrong eyeballs. You know, you said they were mutant and they aren't. And uh, you don't forget that sort of call. And for, for uh, a while there, I was like, oh man, who messed up? What, what went wrong here? And luckily he called me back a day later and he said, well, you know, actually they're not normal. They, they, they've got some abnormalities because we had sent him this and said this was, uh, you know, Murti K knockout mice. And so that began our quest to understand how um, we could have suppressed so dramatically the, uh, the degeneration, photoreceptor degeneration due to loss of MRTK. And the fact that the, um, the suppressive activity was still present in our colony after so many back cross generations when all we were doing was selecting for the MRTK knockout allele was a clue that um, it, where the modifier likely lay. And um, so this would have been the initial line with rapid degeneration and mixed background. And then most of the animals were like this, where the rest of the DNA, except for that, which we were selecting for, was replaced by B6 DNA. And then this is 129, which was from the original ES cell line that was used to make the targeted allele. 
but we hypothesized that a minority of animals had, uh, had a rare recombination that would have replaced some of this fellow traveler DNA from 129 with B6 DNA, and that was the B6 alleles of a gene or genes in this region that was conferring the suppressive activity. So we investigated that hypothesis and scored with genetic markers in the region around the Murti K knockout allele. And indeed, we saw regions that were heterozygous. Um, and in animals that had such uh, heterozygosity, we saw a very interesting phenotype of intermixing of these degenerating regions with uh, normal regions. And um, the time uh, I wasn't aware of an, another phenotype like this that didn't involve DEX inactivation, and this one does not. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested if, if anyone knows of, of this kind of mosaic inter, intermixing. And, and I was quite intrigued by it. And we pursued some hypotheses that there were some perhaps epigenetic phenomena going on, but never, never really uh, saw evidence for that. So we, but we did ask then what happens when we make this homozygote, oh, actually, next thing, we wondered whether um, this, this, by this suppressor activity was addressing the root cause of the degeneration, which is loss of archaeophagous cytosis capability, or was it some kind of bypass suppressor? So we looked at animals that um, the same sections, we were able to do a well-controlled well experiment because we could um, quantify phagosomes within the normal regions and also within the degenerating regions in the same sections. And this work was done by Doug Yasamura in, in Matt's lab. And we can see clearly that um, the, the normal regions have a significantly increased frequency of phagosomes. And so suggesting that this, by this suppressor was in fact addressing the root cause of the degeneration in these MERTK knockout animals. So looking at the homozygous state, then this is the picture that confused Doug initially because the retinas look oh, almost completely normal, except for in the far periphery where there's there's some evidence of degeneration. And so this, this striking, very striking suppression. And this was interesting to us and uh, we wanted to get to the bottom of it. And we uh, knew, had a good idea where the modifier should lay. So we set up a cross and mapped it to two megabases containing 55 candidate genes. And within that region, there was one gene that stuck out uh, as a pretty obvious candidate to look at, and that was Tyro-3. So I mentioned the TAM family of art receptor tyrosine kinases. MERTK is the M, T is for Tyro-3. So it's a paralog of MERTK. And when we looked, uh, all of these animals are MERTK uh, double knockouts. When we looked at the level of Tyro-3 expression in these animals in the RPE, we see that the B6 homozygotes that I just showed you that were suppressed for the generation have a threefold higher level of expression than the 129 homozygotes. And this uh, translates, uh, no pun intended, to the protein levels uh, and about, again, about a, a threefold difference. And importantly, um, like all of these animals are MERTK knockouts, but we could see that in animals that weren't, but still were homozygous for the Tyro 3 129 allele that Tyro-3 is, is down in expression there too. So this uh, type of relationship between genotype and um, expression level is, uh, is emblematic of a expression quantitative trait locus. And I've done a very light treatment of, of this whole story. I still like the story, um, but uh, it was published some time ago. So if anyone wants more details, um, can look at our paper. But reason I I mentioned it is because this finding this EQTL that was suppressing a model of a human of RP38, human uh, ret retinitis pigmentosa, caused me to think more broadly about what EQTLs could be contributing um, to human ocular phenotypes. And specifically in retinal degenerations, there's a lot of phenotypic variability often and unexplained. Right. 
individuals uh, who have mutations in the same gene and even in individuals and families where it's the same mutations in the in, in the same gene. And so I wondered whether EQTLs might be underlying some of that uh, phenotypic variability and we could better understand um, that if we knew more about EQTLs in, in the RPE. And so this is just showing that uh, what I just said about monogenic disease, but importantly, uh, EQTLs had also been found to underlie many of the risk loci that come out of um, genome-wide association studies for complex disease. And so we thought that it would be useful for that reason as well. And we we're aware of a large uh, uh, project called the GTEx uh, project that was aimed at systematically identifying EQTLs in tissues throughout the body using warm autopsies, but the eye had been ignored uh, for, in that project. And, and even if it hadn't been, the RPE is notorious for um, it's being difficult to get intact RNA out of, out of war, war, warm autopsy samples. So um, we wanted to set out and um, address this question. But before I get to that, I just want to make sure I'm sure Anad knows what an EQTL is, but I'm not sure if all uh, ophthalmology uh, research uh, audience does. So I just want to um, go through this. If you take a population sample, a number of under, unrelated individuals, and you, you genotype them, and then you also do expression levels. So you may be getting their blood cells, for instance, and getting expression level by RNA-seq out of their cells and also genotype them comprehensively. You can then look for examples where if you bin them according to their their genotype, is there a regular relationship between the genotype and the expression level? And I hope this is uh, reminiscent of what I just showed you for, for Tyro 3. And if there is, then you can call that uh, an expression quantitative trait uh, locus. And you can do a similar thing for splice quantitative traits, where you are looking for a correlation between the allelic state at a variant and the ratio of splice isoforms. And we, we did both of these. And as I mentioned, um, we didn't take the approach of using uh, autopsy samples, but instead um, we're aware that Dean Bach had quite a collection of human fetal RPE cells and approached Dean and he was uh, game to, to collaborate with us. And so we he sent vials to the la our lab and we differentiated them and um, and made DNA samples and compared, did, did uh, high density genotyping millions of, of variants and we can impute millions more um, and, and compared those genotypes to genotypes from the Thousand Genomes Project that were of known geographic um, ancestry. And what we see in our pink samples here is that they fall in a continuum between African and, and European. And so that defines uh, many of them as uh, African-American samples. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this, some of this ad mixing is almost, the, almost certainly due to America's shameful history with, with regard to slavery. Okay, so we have the, the genotypes. Now and and now we wanted needed the RNA seq, and because we were working in cells and not uh, autopsy samples, we decided to take advantage of that. And and um, our interest in the metabolism of the RPE uh, caused us to perturb these cells metabolically. So we differentiate them for an extended period of time, and then just for a brief twenty four hours, put them in media that differ only in the sugar, whether it be uh, glucose and glutamine or galactose and glutamine. And what that does is galactose is inefficiently metabolized by the glycolytic pathway. And so it forces the cells to metabolize glutamine as an energy source. And most cells will um, oxidize glutamine and to produce ATP. And so what that does is it drives down the glycolytic um, pathway and um, upregulates the oxygen uh, consumption. And so we did RNA-seq on all the lines under these two conditions. And before I get to the EQTL story, we, we, um, it was surprising to me at the, when we were doing this, how little 
publicly available um, RPE RNA seq data was available. So we we wanted to bring as much value as we could out of our our data set. And one question that had been in my mind for years was uh, what tissue is the RPE most like? So we did this uh, project in collaboration with Stephen Montgomery's lab at Stanford. And Stephen is a principal in this GTEx uh, consortium. And so we were able to analyze all of our data in the same pipeline that was used for the GTEx samples and then seamlessly integrate it and, and, uh, and do rigorous comparison between our, our, our fetal RPE uh, data and these GTEx tissues. And so um, we were able to ask, what's it most like? And if uh, I remember once uh, I, I heard Dean Bach say that the RPE is like the liver of the eye. And I assume that's because of the way it handles lipids and retinoids and perhaps complement. Um, but I uh, worked with Sheldon Miller for a while and um, interacted with him. And I'm guessing that Sheldon might think of the RPE more as the kidney of the eye because of its role in, uh, in transporting ions and uh, glucose and its barrier function. And so we did a form of principal component analysis to compare to these 53 GTEx samples. And much to my surprise, uh, the RPE falls here between the brain and this tissue, which is cardiac muscle. So I wonder how many people would have predicted that. Um, and I think uh, this is telling us something about, uh, we at least I hadn't thought of before, about the importance of, of mitochondrial electron transport to, to the RPE. And um, bo all of the, both of these, um, the brain as well, neurons, many neurons in the brain are dependent on, on oxidative phosphorylation. And so I think that's what it's showing us. And now with this new, new lens, I've been looking in the literature and seeing examples of mutations that um, affect in mice that affect the RPE specifically, not the photoreceptors and also the, the heart, for instance. So I think this is an interesting um, new uh, view on, on, on the RPE. All right. Um, so we also wanted to uh, get information from our two metabolic conditions. Our, and, and so we did differential gene expression there and saw a significant number of, of genes that were upregulated in the galactose condition. So it's, it's more of a of a differentiator, more of a stress on the cell than is the, the glucose condition. And do a gene ontology analysis of the, these genes and we see that cholesterol homeostasis is an enriched pathway, significantly enriched, and so is mTOR C1 signaling. And to unpack this cholesterol homeostasis uh, more, we can look at individual genes in the um, lipogenic uh, pathways and see that many of them are upregulated. And you may not be able to see, I guess you can, um, <laughs> these p-values are small, both literally and figuratively. And uh, we were able to get really high power to detect these changes because we, we did an N of 23. Most people doing differential expression may do four or six, but this was an N, N of 23. So we could really detect this. And so, so why is glutamine, uh, forcing the cells to use glutamine causing an in, uh, enhanced uh, you know, lipogenesis in these cells. Well, Jin Hai Du and colleagues showed that unlike a lot of cells, our fetal RPE cells um, undergo, take glutamine and, and do a reductive decarboxylation of glutamine, which will generate citrate that is a, 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 a substrate for, for lipid synthesis then. And so they, a, a majority of the glutamine is going through that pathway rather than being oxidized as it is in, in many other cells. So that's why we think that's happening. I, I'm not clear at all um, on why it, the cells are also upregulating lipid uptake in the, in the face of, um, of making so much uh, endogenous or uh, lipid as well. But it's, it's interesting that another group has shown that in early uh, 
AMD and the macula of the RPE, macular RPE, um, some of these same genes are, are being uh, upregulated. And so this may be um, modeling some features of, of uh, early AMD. I, I, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Maybe we can talk more about that. So to get to the main event, uh, we, we sought to identify uh, EQTLs and we were fortunate that this, this uh, rascal program was, it came out about the time we were doing this because we had a modest number of samples. Um, many EQTL projects deal with you know, scores or hundreds of samples and, and we, had, we had 23. And so this program was actually developed to be useful on a, a num on, it, was, it was shown to work with, with 24 samples. So we thought we had a chance here. It combines both inter-individual uh, signals of the type I showed you earlier with the binning of the, the um, individuals according to their genotype with allele specific signals. And this is really powerful in that um, if you have a variant that's falling within the RNA itself and you sequence uh, the RNA, you can just read the sequence off to know the proportion of, of reads that are coming from one allele versus the other. And it's really well controlled situation because it's all coming from the, the same cell. And um, I wanted to point out that when we started this, you know, it, it worked uh, ultimately, but um, going into it, we weren't sure with this uh, modest number of samples and uh, this, they, each coming from a different gestational age. And, um, you know, we tried to differentiate them all at the same time in the same positions, but some of you may have noticed the, the, the differences in pigmentation among the different, um, different lines. And so would things like that, um, you know, be a, a noise level that would obscure the differences in gene in, in expression due, due to the genetics. We, we weren't sure, but ultimately uh, we are able to control for many of these variables and, um, and, and identified over a thousand uh, high confidence EQTLs, most of which were shared between the two conditions, but some of which were um, condition specific. Our collaborators really uh, undertook a rigorous uh, approach to decide whether these actually were uh, condition specific. And I'm just showing an example of each type down here. And it's interesting to think about, well, what's going on with these condition specific EQTLs? Uh, we, we know from experience now that many, um, the causative variants for these EQTLs often fall, not surprisingly, in regulatory sequences for genes. And so this is saying that uh, there are transcription factors that are acting through variants and these transcription factors are only um, being engaged under the galactose condition. And so that was interesting to us given that it's a metabolic stress on the, on the uh, RPE. And, and we in investigated this further to try to understand what some of those transcription factors might be. And so you can just take um, the lead SNP for each of these 166 galactose specific um, EQTLs and just do uh, go 15 base pairs on either side from, from the genome, in the genome, take a, a, a 30 base pair um, section and just make a sequence file less than 5 KB and search it then to ask whether there are any enrichment for any transcription factors given uh, compared to what you'd expect on uh, you know, random chance. And indeed, we saw enrichment for um, some factors that make some sense. Uh, this has been connected with the response of cells to glucose deprivation. And this has been connected with regulation of aerobic glycolysis. But surprisingly, there's this transcription factor has uh, been is known to upregulate proteasomal subunits and why that should be engaged by uh, forcing fetal RPE cells to metabolize glutamine and put them in a lipogenic state is a, is a mystery to me. Um, and then we've got examples here that certainly aren't fly or, or plant um, transcription factors. They're just signals that we haven't yet been able to resolve um, well enough to, to know what the mammalian um, uh, transcription factor is. And so with, if we can scale this up and get more uh, galactose-specific genes, we should be able to learn more about the, the gene regulatory network that is 
being engaged and uh, it, due to this, this metabolic stress on the fetal RPE. So in terms of relevance of our findings and our data set to uh, monogenic disease, this is, I've got one slide to, to, for that. Um, and it's, a, it's an example, it's a speculative example. We, we found EQTL in uh, four, at least four different genes that were known to be associated with axial length in humans due to uh, you know, monogenic disease and or, and or um, studies of, uh, of complex uh, GWAS of, of axial length. And the RPE is, is very well situated here um, between the neural retina and uh, to receive signals uh, as to how the light, where the focal point is falling on the neural retina, those signals and transduce them to the sclera, which then uh, needs to grow in response to, to that signal, grow or not. And um, a, some years ago, uh, Sundin et al. showed that mutations in MFRP, which uh, hadn't been, we found an EQTL in it, it hadn't been found in any other tissue, um, are, that they cause recessive nanophthalmus. And they used this family to come to that conclusion. And all the individuals in this generation have two mutations um, in their coding sequence as, as expected. But the authors pointed out that this individual which had a more mild phenotype, had only one obvious mutant allele and speculated that the other allele may uh, have um, decreased uh, transcription or RNA stability or, um, or, or splicing problem. And I, I you know, could suggest that um, these are, our EQTLs are always due to common, common variants, you know, especially in our case with our small uh, sample size. And so you can easily imagine that a, a common variant was, came, came in, for instance, with this individual. And if it, if it was for a, a lower expressing allele of MFRP, that that could have contributed. So that's, like I said, total speculation. But my point is to, I'm really hoping we've made our data publicly available, that, that people who have access to families like this will, and, and th that uh, contain this sort of phenotypic variability, will use the data to investigate whether uh, modifiers, EQTLs may be responsible for some of their um, the variability in their families. Okay, so with respect to complex disease, something more substantial to say, and um, this co-localization uh, approach is, is very powerful um, for uh, understanding uh, uh, some of the loci that have come out of, of GWAS studies, because one can ask uh, uh, rigorously, what is the degree of congruence of the EQTL signal or, or not with uh, the GWAS signal? So in a genomic region, you get a, a, a risk profile from the, from the G, GWAS, and, and we also get a, a profile from usually the same set of variants have been tested uh, for an expression quantitative trait locus. So you can do that co-localization and it's very, it's powerful. It tells you a number of things. First of all, there's always multiple candidate genes when you get a signal like this. And so if you see something like this, it's a big arrow to that, to one particular gene saying, that's what's uh, underlying the risk um, at, at this locus. And so it helps identify the gene. And if you then can understand the relationship between the um, allelic relationship, is it the allele that's associated with risk of the disease, the one that's causing increased expression of this gene or decreased expression? So if you understand that, it gives you some insight into mechanism. And then finally, um, if the EQTL is only occurring in a subset of tissues, it gives you some, it helps narrow down what, what tissues may be uh, responsible and, and where the pathogenic activity mechanism is, is, is occurring. So a very powerful approach. And we did that um, in, to, for uh, two different um, GWAS that we were able to get summary statistics for. And first was for AMD uh, from Fritch et al. And the second was for myopia 
And we got this through a data transfer agreement with 23andMe. And when we do the co-localization of eQTLs with the AMD GWAS, we see that uh, RDH5 is very prominent. It had been suggested as a possible uh, gene by Fritsch et al, but there are other candidates uh, were also in that, that locus. And so we would say, well, no, nope, it's probably RDH5. And then there were additional genes that hadn't been selected, suggested as, as AMD uh, risk uh, genes, but uh, with our co-localization, we, we believe they are. And when we do co-localization with the SQTL, there's RDH5 again, sticking up. And for myopia, um, RDH5 is, is both SQTL and EQTL again. Um, it had been suggested by Pickerel as a, um, as a candidate gene, um, and, uh, but clustering was, had not in the original GWAS, but then a subsequent uh, meta-analysis for axial length that had many more patients in it identified clustering as involved in uh, axial length in humans. So kind of a related, a related phenotype. So given this, uh, uh, what's happening with RDH5, we wanted to look at that in more detail. We saw that it's the same variant in all cases that's, that's responsible. And, and we thought this was very interesting and, and wanted to pursue it further. And this may not be necessary for this crowd, but we'll just make sure everyone knows that what RDH5 does catalyzes the last step in the visual cycle and um, mutations in RDH5 are associated with a fundus albipunctatus FA, which can have macular uh, involvement. So the, the alleles that, uh, the variants that we found, um, this is the one was our lead eSNP. It's in tight uh, linkage disequilibrium with something in the third exon of RDH5. This is about 40 base pairs uh, out, out from the splice donor. And this haplotype is really quite uh, reasonably frequent in Europeans and Ashkenazi Jews, and even more so in, in South Asians. And so we thought might be uh, it, it useful to, to understand more how it's causing uh, this, this uh, EQTL effect. And when we look at the magnitude of that, we see that it's on the order of threefold, this is the reference allele and the minor allele, a threefold effect. So not insubstantial and, and surprisingly similar to the size of the effect that we saw in Tyro 3 and in the mouse model. And the, the uh, splice EQTL, we bin samples according to the, the uh, reference allele or whether they contain the, the uh, minor allele, we see that the frequency of this aberrant splice product isoform that skips this major coding exon and fuses two out of phase exons such that you get a premature stop codon in the penultimate exon of RDH5. So that should uh, subject these uh, splice um, isoforms to nonsense mediated decay. Then, and so we tested that by uh, differentiating one of our heterozygous cell lines and treating it with cyclohexamide, which is known to stabilize uh, messages that are subject to nonsense mediated decay. And the normal isoform is you know, just not affected by cyclohexamide, but as predicted by our um, model, the abnormal isoform is stabilized. So some of you may be, puzzled uh, as to how a, uh, that, that minor uh, splice uh, isoform could be, con uh, could be connected with a threefold effect in the EQTL. And it's because Nansen's mediated K is, is highly efficient, over 90% efficient. Um, and so we can back calculate from that, that about 75% of the transcripts from this minor allele are, uh, are abnormal and then they're subject to nonsense mediated decay leading to a threefold steady state uh, effect in, in the EQTL. And um, importantly, this haplotype is associated with increased risk for AMD, which maybe given the situation with FA isn't, isn't too hard to understand, 
but it's it, it's associated with decreased risk for myopia, which is is more of um, a mystery, at least to me. So we we thought we'd nailed it. Um, Good. We know what what are it's what gene is at this locus. It's RDH five, and we have a beginnings of a of a mechanism for two different um, diseases. And our interest is in AMD. But then, uh, about the same time, Anad uh, and his collaborators published this paper, and um, I'll just say that this is not. It's a neural retinal, retinal transcriptome. Uh, it does not include the RPE, which I consider to be part of the retina. And, um, and they concluded the same uh, exact variant is associated with EQTL in this gene, which is block 1S1. And it's a neighbor. It's the next door neighbor of RDH5. Here's RDH5. Here are these two variants in exon 3. And block 1S1 is over here. And in fact, the relationship, the allelic relationship is the opposite of ours, that the major allele is, is associated with lower expression of block 1S1, whereas in our case, the major allele is uh, associated with higher expression of, of RDH5. So I think um, we were, a, a, a nice compromise is that we're both right. Um, uh, they wouldn't have seen RDH5 because it's not appreciably expressed in the neural retina and our small sample size was probably um, underpowered to detect this more modest difference in the level of, of expression of block 1S1. But we can try to get at that question and also at, at, at whether the, these variants that we've identified are actually causal. They right now are just correlated with the splicing. And, um, and so we've identified an ES cell line that uh, is heterozygous at the DNA level. And when we take and differentiate it, we get a nice increase in expression of RDH5 and see both isoforms. If we sequence this PCR product, we get um, as expected uh, uh, both uh, alleles showing up there and we can then just clone some of those uh, products and sequence them and see a, a similar uh, ratio of um, abnormal splice to, to, to normal splice form. So this, um, we're now uh, going in and editing um, these the sites in order to identify whether they're causal. And we hope to be able to uh, settle whether uh, this is, you know, what genes, if they are causal, what genes are affected by the changing the, the uh, allelic state at those, at those variants. So we also identified PARP12 as a new AMD gene. And um, that was it, the, the evidence is that uh, it's the same variant that's associated very high uh, confidence for the EQTL effect, subthreshold for the GWAS uh, AMD risk allele, but together the, the two uh, types of information uh, strongly suggest that PARP12 is a, a new AMD gene. And um, what is PARP12? What does it do? It's a mono ADP ribosylase. It adds ADP ribose to target proteins. Not much is known about it. It's an interferon inducible gene, like, so, like hundreds, uh, there's hundreds such genes, but it's one of them. And um, virologists have studied it and found that it tags proteins, viral proteins, when, when they're infecting a cell for degradation. And so we don't have any idea what this, how this might be contributing to AMD. I think it's a very interesting pathway to uh, explore and uh, whether it's being induced by interferon, uh, some data showing that uh, interferon milieu increases with age in uh, parts of the mouse brain. Uh, by Andrew Ney, my colleague at Stanford. And so could it be that? Could it have anything to do with viruses? Uh, we don't know, but we'd like to understand this better. And we've, um, we've got uh, funding from, from Merck to investigate this in stem cells as well uh, to, and models, uh, models uh, for stressor, AMD stressors. So um, this, this summarizes what uh, I've just said, told you, retold the story uh, about uh, EQTL associated with a modifier in, in mice and how that motivated us to, to study, um, uh, look for EQTLs in, in human fetal RPE. 
and the perturbation, metabolic perturbation, priming uh, cells for lipogenesis by forcing them to use uh, glutam glutamine and, um, and, and the gene regulatory network beginnings of one that we can uh, see uh, uh, from in that perturbation. And then the, the one sort of known AMD gene and, uh, and one new one. So I clearly, I have enough time. So I'm going to, I told you I have a little coda here. And this is, um, skip over my credits right now. And I wanted to uh, just talk briefly about um, a story that uh, we're gonna present at Arvo, but only part of it. So you should definitely, that's the point, is I wanna get, get, you know, give you a taste of it. So hopefully you'll, you'll look up uh, the presentation. So a long time ago, we um, knocked out TFAM in the mouse RPE to um, and specifically, and TFAM is necessary for the replication and transcription of a mitochondrial DNA. So it led to a significant defect in OxFOS in the RPE, and that uh, triggered a uh, mTOR and an increase in aerobic glycolysis and lipogenesis, and um, ultimately uh, a degeneration of the photoreceptors. And so this was useful at the time. It established the importance of uh, my, RP mitochondrial transport for uh, not only the phenotype of the RPE, but also for the uh, well-being of the photoreceptors. And, but it was like hitting the, hitting the RPE with a sledgehammer metabolically. And we wanted to uh, see if we could tease apart a little more the relationship between RP metabolism and its, its cell phenotype and also RP metabolism and photoreceptor um, homeostasis. And so um, this, is, this is what we did by knocking out TFAM. All of these complexes are deficient now, except for complex two, which is nuclear encoded. And we are aware of work from um, in cell culture where uh, expressing yeast NDI1 and C squared AOX, uh, these are alternative oxidases, which can accept electrons from, for instance, uh, NADH and transfer them uh, to water so they can bypass the, the need for uh, these uh, endogenous complexes, transfer them, sorry, to oxygen and produce water. And so this, in theory, should allow reestablishment of the the TCA cycle, but importantly, there's no, uh, no ATP made. There's no proton gradient being generated by, by this activity. So it's not gonna help with any ATP deficits, but it should allow regeneration, for instance, of, of NADH and also um, running some of the, the TCA cycle. So um, that was our question. What happens when if we restore, can we restore the TCA cycle and respiration to the RPE, the TFAM deficient RPE, and Ming Chen and the lab is um, driving this project forward, and he's going to have the presentation. And so I hope you'll you'll look for him, and I'll give you a, just a little taste of of what he's going to say. And we surprisingly, or I was surprised anyway, that how effective this um, expression. So we made a transgenic mice that that express these these two zine xenobiotic proteins in the specifically in the RPE that's lacking T, TFAM. And it, it you know, really allows the photoreceptors to, to survive for, for quite some time. And, and the function of the photoreceptors is also maintained. And Ming has other, other data and we've got, um, we've done a metabolic flux experiment with uniformly labeled uh, glucose that we're um, starting to analyze the the uh, results of, and so I hope you'll uh, you'll check out his poster when uh, when you go to Arvo. And here's my final uh, uh, acknowledgement slide. And the people who drove the uh, Melissa Calton did all of the wet bench work for the HTL uh, study, and Bosch Liu in the Montgomery Lab led the the analysis. And um, Dean and Jane Hu were very critical in, in being able to supply us with the fetal RPE and, and then the modifier story was done with Matt Vale's lab. So that's it, 45 minutes according to my, my clock.
Good presentation, very informative. Uh, I have a one quick question. Maybe I just don't remember any more math, but uh, principal component analysis doesn't have a physical. <laughs> so is that really, um, is that really correct to say that uh, RPE is between art and uh, brain? So uh, there was a word that dropped out. So principal component analysis doesn't have a physical, what did you say? Physical meaning, it is just a vectorial analysis of the multiple points and reduction of in space. And so in this case, uh, does this really have a physical meaning to say that RPE is between heart and brain? Well, I think it does, yes. Um, I mean, we can do PCA, like I, I showed you the PCA for um, geographic ancestry. So that's very clear. That's what's so powerful in my view about PCA is it's agnostic. It, it makes no assumptions. <laughs> it just says, show us structure in the data. And what it's saying is there's some structure in the, the RPE transcriptome that's most similar to you know structures in the uh, brain and structures in the uh, in cardiac muscle. So no, I, I think yeah, I think it's important. I mean, um, yeah, like I said, would you would you say that? Yeah, okay, I, I I've made my there argument. Is, like, I, there, I, it's, is no, it, there is no physical meaning where it lands in the two dimensional uh, space. So uh, it, it, we cannot just say that uh, I believe, but may, maybe I'm wrong. I will study that and get back to you. Well, right. let, let's let's just go. So I, I'm interested in then what what you what you would make of um, of uh, of uh, oops of this. What do you make of this then? Does this not tell you? Do you do you say? Oh well, no, you can't say these are African American um, when when PCA is showing them nicely on this gradient between. I mean, there's there's no physical thing saying these are African-American, it's just clear that the, the variants are, are telling you that they are and that these, these individuals are all very much alike. So these are, these are Europeans. Again, there's no physical, it's, it's the state of the variants. And yes, that, that's correct, but it doesn't, yeah, all right. But it doesn't tell you that the green are further away than the, uh, on the right, this, uh, Red, right? The, the, the distance of those is not really making any meaning, I guess. Uh, no, I, I think it is. For instance, these individuals have more European contribution. Um, you know, they'll have more European alleles than than these individuals. Okay, so it's telling you, um, yes. And so I think just in the same way, um, what it's telling you about. Um, uh, oops, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> uh, you know, for the I'm trying to get to the this slide, it's telling you that whatever it is, the structure um, we don't know. In the in the case, um, you know, it's telling you that there is something, and I I do agree that we do not know what. Um, I agree we do not know what, but that there is something about the level of expression of various genes. Um, is you know is the most obvious thing um, in in th these data that are pulling this thing to uh, to fall between these two tissues and not over here even though they share a, you know they, they share some gene expression with those and, and so forth so but I we maybe we can agree that we don't know what's doing what's causing it to lie there but it seems like you're saying that it's it's not. It's it's not useful to know that it lies there, but I and that that's where I would I would differ. All right, let's uh, move to other people. They have a question. So uh, Rada, Rada, are you there? Sorry, I'm here, but I took time for me to unmute myself. Um, great talk, Doug, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, you know, you, you talked about the RDH5 EQTL and which is, uh, actually I just checked the frequency and it's about 10% in South Asians. And uh, so as you mentioned, like it is likely to result in NMD. So with the 
endogamous nature of populations in South Asian region. Do you expect to see this at higher frequency in uh, uh, patients with RD? Okay, so you said you think it's 10% in, in Caucasians? No, Southeast Asians. Okay, um, so, so I got this off of Nomad and, um, and so it says, I, I guess I, it's, it's a third. And so your question is, would I, ex so I, I think it's, it's a, a third allele frequency of 0.3 in South Asians. And so your question is, might you see it then in, um, in, 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 in RP? So someone who's got uh, FA due, due to a mutation in, uh, in RDH5 with you know, one, one allele and would they, would they have another allele that, um, that has, has this? Is that your question? Yeah, a either that or because if it is um, at high frequency and if it is resulting in NMD, um, you know, do you expect it to contribute to, um, you know, some patient IRD in some of the So, so uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked. That's, that's what I would like to, I, to know. It seems to me that um, it, it could well. Uh, I guess we don't know. It, it could well. So the question then becomes, what's the sort of the lowest level of, so you've got one allele that's say complete loss of function. And now you've got um, the, 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 this, this, this haplotype here that's causing um, whatever, you know, a, a, a reduced, significantly reduced level from wild type, one third the level of wild type. So the question then is, uh, is one third uh, RDH5 enough? to supply, you know, and to have a normal retina. One, one, one third, let's see, it's, it's even less than one third, right? It's like, um, I guess it's, 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 it's one sixth if, uh, you know, if you've got two alleles and you're missing 100% of one and you're down, uh, down to a third of the other, then the question is, is that, is that remainder of activity sufficient to, um, to, to uh, sustain, you know, a normal retina? And I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know if Chris, if Chris has could uh, has a, has an opinion, but um, that's the sort of question that I'm I'm interested in. I would I, I would I hope that some individual people that had families bigger families with RDH5 mutations and if there's variability could could um, you know ask 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 that sort of question. Yeah, because we we see like not in RDH5, but otherwise in general we see. Um, patients with one allele and missing the second allele. And then if this is something contributing, so we should be paying attention to it. Thanks, yeah. And, and, I, and then I, again, not my area, uh, but wondering whether there could be interactions in, with different loci, other, you know, in the visual cycle, some, you know, um, right, mutations in, in other genes in the visual cycle that may be um, not, uh, sufficient to cause disease, but then if you pair them with with a reduction in in function, say at, at another locus like this at RDH five, could that explain some of the uh, cases? Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Doc, is the good news, uh, Brother Anand will make a final comments uh, at the end. But we have four questions here in the room, Emma. Hi, oh, Dr. Palmer. Uh, um, my name is Emma, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Dr. Timothy Kern. So I'm interested in the better retinopathy. I was wondering if you have performed any studies of colocalization of EQTLs, myopia, and diabetic retinopathy. And di diabetic retinopathy, did you say? Yes. Okay. So, oh, well, um, we haven't done anything with diabetic retinopathy, I can say that. Um, uh, you, you asked about co-localization of EQTLs with myopia, we did, but, and, and diabetic retinopathy, sort of a combined phenotype, is that, is that what you're talking about? People that have yes. both? Yes. Have both? Um, yes. No, we haven't, haven't looked at that. Um, if someone has a, has a, um, you know, a good data set, we, we'd definitely be interested. It, it, uh, we, we got our hands on the, the, the GWAS summary statistics that were 
readily available. Um, one question that I, I, so we haven't, but you didn't ask this question, but I thought you might be asking it because I've gotten it in the past is, um, well, you've got this one allele that's, you know, you know causing the, or protecting against myopia and, and, and risk for AMD, you know, what do you know about the coincidence of those two phenotypes? Um, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it's definitely a reasonable question. Um, and I can, I found one paper from, a, from, from Korea where they, they were looking at, um, um, at, at, at that question. And I think it, they didn't, they didn't really um, answer it to, to my, you know, to, to any, any degree. So as far as I know, there's no, um, there's no one that studied and said that, oh yeah, people, people um, with myopia are, are, you know, more protected from AMD or vi sorry, without myopia, let's see, they would, they would not have myopia and they would have AMD. So, um, but these are very complex diseases with multiple loci, right? And multiple probably disease mechanisms. So it, it's, it's not, not surprising that you might not see, see that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Volrath. Thank you so much for that really interesting talk. Um, so I had a couple of questions. I kind of will start with questions about that PCA, comparing uh, kind of expression profiles from different tissues. So within the PCA, there are like major genes that are primary drivers of that um, clustering. So I was wondering if you looked at the, the primary genes that are kind of influencing that clustering where you see RPE kind of taking the position between cardiac muscle and brain. And I was wondering if within such a diverse, uh, so, such a diverse array of cells where you're really profiling the entire body, mm -hmm. if a lot of those drivers are like primarily metabolic genes that are pan-expressed, um, in many cell types, but the RPE metabolically resembles brain and cardiac muscle more than other cell types. So I think that's a, a great question. We didn't um, didn't dive down to try to see what the uh, if if there were genes that were primarily uh, driving this association. I can um, I can I'm I'm writing it down. I will. Um, send that question on to um, Bosch Lu and see if he thinks we can get any any detail out of. What yeah, I would be I would be really curious to see like what are the primary drivers of that of that clustering. Right. And then, and then my second question kind of pertains to that really interesting observation that you see a PPAR gene being upregulated. So. Do you have hypotheses as to what cells might be the primary producers of interferon within the retinal microenvironment under disease? Okay, so it's <laughs> it's not PCAR, it's PARP twelve. Um, or we we did PARP say 12, sorry we, we did see we did see something with PCAR, but I didn't present that. Um, sorry, but, that's what I meant. So what could be? Yeah, what could? Um, yeah, no, not there. Not here. Here, here's something I can say is that um, there's evidence that mitochondrial dysfunction can induce um, uh, interferon and basically innate immunity genes. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and and PARP12 is one of them. There are a couple other PARPs, and there are some. There, there's about uh, I don't know. 30 um, such genes at least. And um, so that was very interesting when I became aware of that because it, there might be an intersection between, um, right, between uh, our two uh, lines of investigation here in, in, in the lab. And so, so that's, that's a thought. Um, uh, could, could uh, you know, some, could, could an actual viral infection? I don't know, but and I also mentioned that with age, there's evidence that um, the interferon sort of reactivity increases um, in in uh, with age. And that, that study that I'm quoting actually also has 
T cells invading the this part right, of the hip, right. hippocampus. I was kind of thinking, like, what are the contributions from invading immune cells right. that are not tissue resident versus you know just innate production of interferon? By right. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Can't uh, can't say. Um, and your comment about could it be uh, in your first first question could could metabolic drivers um, be Yes, I mean that's basically what I'm. Um, uh, what I, I was do. just thinking of how these PCAs are run, and typically, like the genes that are expressed across most or all of the cell types, will probably be greater influencers of this clustering rather than cell type specific markers. I guess that 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 makes yeah that makes sense because um, you're trying to compare you know things that express very different genes. I, I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how the PCA clustering would be with those sessions, but thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Doug, as everybody has said, very nice talk and good to see you. Hi, Don. Um, so, so I'm amazed that the, you know, as you mentioned with relatively few samples, what was it, 24, you were able to find a uh, significant EQTL. It kind of reminds me of Josephine Ho's original GWAS with complement factor H that nobody <laughs> thought a hundred patients would show something, but it's, a, it's impressive. So I was wondering, since you showed significant differences with two different uh, yeah. metabolic stressors, are you thinking of other challenges? You know, you've got these cells and it looks like your method's working. So what other challenges yeah to the cells are you thinking of doing to maybe look for other relationships or you know, and, uh, oxidative stress or other kinds of stressors that might be either biologically relevant or clinically relevant? Great, yep. Yeah, I was, I was uh, very happy that it, it worked and um, uh, it is a small number. I think, uh, I, I think Anad's probably working on something where there are bigger numbers, um, but if it's from, autopsy samples than your question about how, you know, we, we can perturb ours. And so what other kind of perturbations? Well, um, you know, pretty, pretty standard, for instance, um, something with cigarette smoke for uh, cigarette smoke extract would be a possibility. Um, uh, something like uh, Jason Miller's uh, using UV irradiated uh, outer segments and stressing stressing the cells that way these are these are things we've we've thought of if you have um if you have something to suggest i'm, I'm interested in hearing well so far just the obvious ones you've mentioned but we can think more about it yeah it sounds like a great opportunity yeah mm -hmm. thank you uh, hi dr Vora. thank you for the interesting talk a quick question about the first part of your presentation so you showed very nicely that tyro 3 is a modifier for MERTK uh, associated retinal degeneration. Did you ever explore whether MERTK, whether TYRO3 also is a modifier in other uh, RP models, or is it really only specific and limited to MERTK? Right, we we didn't. Um, I'm trying to think of. Um, uh, let's see. I mean, we we made you know made the community aware that they should be looking. Um, at their mouse, because Tyro 3 has been looked at in um, lots of different, you know, in macrophages and, uh, um, and the, these, these, the TAM family receptors work in Sutoli cells and, um, yeah, and clearance of, of red blood cells um, and so forth. So, um, so it's, there were, there were lots of papers saying, you know, uh, this this member of the family is or is not required uh, for for process X. I just named three three processes as and um, and the knowledge that now that you could have such a big difference in expression of one of those um, without uh, you know if if you weren't aware of it you might um, might be misinterpreting some of some of those those studies. So so that much. Um, I was hoping we'd get sorted out by, uh, by people in other areas, other fields, but I, I didn't, um, didn't consider really crossing to another RPE model. Um, an obvious question that uh, is, what do we know about Tyro 3 in human disease? And we, we, we did look into that and collaborated with, um, um, with 
uh, Isabelle Adieu in, in Paris, and she was kind enough to send us uh, all you know, 30 some examples of, of Mertike um, knockout, or sorry, not, not knockout, sorry, patient samples, people who had our, our, our P38 basically. And we looked at the at Tyro 3 in those samples and didn't see any evidence that, for instance, of any enrichment for any allele. The numbers are still somewhat um, limited, but didn't see any evidence that it's modifying um, RP38 in some way. Um, so I don't, do you have another RPE model that you would think would be, make sense to test for, for Tyro 3 modifying it? No, I was asking even more general whether retinitis pigmentosa, for instance, might be also modified by, uh, by this protein. Right. Um, so uh, now the one test that we've done in humans is, is the one that I described. I think um, to the extent that these TAM family receptors are also involved in um, signaling in innate immunity and, um, and uh, that they, to the extent that, that uh, an infla any kind of inflammatory process is in involved more generally in RP, then I could see that, it, that there might be some overlap, but... Um, but at this point, we just looked looked at the one model. Thank you. All right, two more questions and then final comments to Brother Anand. So Brother Anand, you, you prepare yourself. And now <laughs> Alex. Yeah, hi, this is Alex from Dr. Pacheski. Uh, this will be a little bit of topic question, I guess, but I was wondering about this nonsense mediated decay. I saw the results of your experiment where uh, you know we were inhibiting it to um, to boost the presence of this alternative splicing variant. And I was just wondering, what, do you know maybe whether there is any natural variability occurring in this pathway in the human? And is this something that could influence potentially also the, the level, you know, the severity of uh, some variations that, that we are identifying? I really like your question. Um, in fact, uh, my collaborator, Stephen Montgomery, uh, had a, a graduate student who, um, who used, looked at, uh, um, at GTEx data and, um, and, and, and uh, mutation data and tried to do a global search for evidence that there could be um, different ef efficiencies of NMD in different tissues. And could, could that explain you know, why some mutations, uh, mutations are, right, germline mutations in humans are every, every tissue, right, but, but only uh, the symptoms appear only in a subset, so could it have anything to do um, in these cases of premature stops with um, the, the efficiency of AN, A, NMD varying between different human tissues, and uh, she, she saw, found no uh, evidence of that. I was on her thesis committee, uh, Nikki Tur Turin, and um, um, but she did find out some some interesting stuff about um, evidence of how um, uh, these uh, early stops are well rules about um, about what what is likely to be engaged by NMD um, in what types of mutations are are likely to be efficiently detected and. Um, and processed by NMD in, in a more global sense in, in, in all tissues and many transcripts. So I can uh, um, I, I suggest that you, if you're interested to look at her, at her paper, uh, it was on bioarchives last time I looked, I'm not sure if it's published now, but last name is T-E-R-A-N, first, first initial N, and um, I'm not on the paper, but uh, Stephen Montgomery is the is the lead author, and that's his name here. So I think it's yeah, it's an interesting um, question. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, now that Hall. I now that I'm worn down. Uh, one more question. This is okay. last question. Uh, last one, uh, and we won't torture you anymore. Uh, thank you, Dr. Volrat, for a great talk. Uh, again, question regarding uh, nonsense mediated uh, nonsense mediated decay uh, RDH5. Um, 
you said that roughly the mRNA transcript is uh, three times lower than in the wild type situation. Uh, is, does this correspond to the protein? Uh, did you maybe have a chance to measure the protein levels of this, of RDH5? And uh, how about other um, uh, genes? Um, do, we, do, do you know of any other, except uh, RDH5 and PARP12? Do, do, do you have any other candidates um, that uh, are undergoing the same kind of uh, uh, non-submediated decay? So, so PARP12 is not, there's no NMD there. That's just um, co-localization of an EQTL with a GWAS signal. Um, didn't look at the protein. I think it's a very reasonable uh, question. Um, I, I was just in answering Rada's, um, Rada's question, I was assuming that you know, it's a third lower in the protein and the activity. So that, that, could, be, that could be wrong. Um, we probably should. I think it's it is, um, more situation of, of um, right, of, uh, of just not having enough cells at the time. And we were looking at the RNA, so uh, we, didn't, we didn't do an immunoblot. But in principle, it would, it would, not, be, um, it would not be hard to do. So uh, we, we probably should, should do that to, before I start speculating as to how much the activity of RDH5 might be down. Before Anad asks the question, I have a question for everyone. Um, how, does, how does lower RDH5, assuming that it is down, well, it's, it's down, the RNA is down, and we'll assume the, uh, how does that um, lead to relative protection against myopia? Does anybody have any? ideas about that? I don't have any clue. Okay. I have, I have an, I, I thought a lot of, I went down one rabbit hole that I think was wrong. There was a paper published, uh, Chris, that in PNAS, zebrafish, the RDH5, one of, they have like two orthologs, I think, in zebrafish. And one of them, they, this paper, 2000, 2009 says, hey, RDH5 makes retinoic acid, and, and we, we went down that rabbit hole, and in the end... Um, this is obviously wrong, because it's the dehydrogenase that oxidizes or reduces aldehyde to alcohol. Uh, the aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is a completely different set of enzymes, oxidizes to retinoic acid. So uh, that, that's just like, uh, because it's retinoid is something, that all of them the same. But retinol and retinoic acid are completely chemically different entities. Yeah, I, I looked at the, the JBC original JBC paper that was, you know, uh, that described the retinol um, dehydrogenase and and then you know and there there were oh it could act on you know some of these less abundant forms besides eleven cis it said there was activity on you know, 13 and some others. I, I'm not, I, obviously I don't wanna, <laughs> I, but anyway, I went down that, that hole and anyway, there's a paper that says that um, uh, another PNAS paper, McCaffrey 1996, that says that um, in mice, when once you, the mice, start, the retina gets exposed to light, of course you start to, um, yeah, you start to activate the, with the visual cycle going and that that leaves substrates that then can be siphoned off by the right enzymes, not RDH5, to make more retinoic acid. And they measure, they measure retinoic acid and so show that it's a, it's a function of, of exposure to light. Um, uh, there is a very difficulty uh, in analyzing retinoic acid at the level that is present in the eye. So this is main technical problem. The, the, there are some methods right now, maybe it's worth to revisit that, but 20 years ago, there were no methods that could be so sensitive to looking at slight changes. So I, I think it's worth to revisit that. But keep in mind that also those short chain alcohol dehydrogenases, they also utilize steroid family of compounds. And so uh, it is quite well known uh, for many of them that they not only utilize retinoids, but also steroids. And so that could be more related to that, I could see it, rather than to retinoic acid directly, RDH5. RDH5 could be working on steroids, you're saying, okay. Okay, because retinoic acid is known to be a modulator for in myopia. That's why 
but uh, but the but there were things that didn't make sense in in, in yeah I, it, it, yeah okay I better I, and now I give you uh, for final comments and final words from uh, Dr. Swaru. We're all waiting for it. So great talk, uh, uh, Doug, again. I mean, as everyone mentioned. So I, I, I actually, when I wrote my comments, I was, uh, I, I wanted to make a couple of comments based on what Chris started and then Radha said. But before I do that, I must say that the title which, which you said for our paper, Retina, is accurate because we do have some contamination of RPE in our retina. We never tried to make it pure neural retina. That's why we said retina. In but you our didn't say anything about RPE genes then, really. Yeah, we do, have, we, we do have some RPE genes there too. Um, anyway, uh, I mean, it may not be completely accurate because we don't know how much of RPE might be there uh, at, at that stage. But anyway, and that was also peripheral retina. Um, but, uh, you know, coming to the multidimensional scaling plot that you showed where Chris was commenting, uh, how come RPE is there? I think that there are a couple of things that when we were doing our own analysis, we, 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 we had a lot of, uh, you know, it took us a lot of effort. Uh, we had to do the analysis in identical manner uh, for both GTEx and our uh, samples and 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 there are just you know thousands of GTEx samples that existed, so it was not uh, and and you have only twenty three or twenty four samples. So sometimes because there is a tremendous variation in expression, you could have some changes in where RPE is being placed. Um, so I think. I would be a little bit careful in saying it's close to heart or brain until you, you reach a maybe 80 or 100 sample threshold somehow because variations among different samples can, can be enormous actually. Uh, that's what we found and uh, you know, when we were doing our analysis. Um, so that was one point I said, and I think you, you have not checked uh, or Montgomery has not check uh, how close RPE could be to the retina uh, samples that we have, I bet it will be pretty close because we, we will have some RPE genes there and you will find uh, those two will be pretty close to each other. So I just wanted to make uh, that comment. Uh, and also fetal, you have fetal RPE, or rather fetal RPE, which could be extremely heterogeneous. Uh, with cells at different stages, probably, and uh, some may be very immature, while others may be very mature. So that heterogeneity can also place it in different places too. So I, I just sort of, yeah. So I think one one should be a little bit careful there, probably. So I, I would, uh, yeah. And the second comment that I had is about Radha's. Um, a question and again, I would say, I mean, I, it's not our work. It's a work with our collaborator, Alex Segre, who is doing SQTLs actually in a very extensive way. We also have for uh, macula actually, and there are differences between peripheral retina and macula uh, for this particular locus. Uh, the story probably what you have uh, is is, is probably going to change slightly. And uh, uh, in your direction, actually, your overall part is, I think is going to pan out, but it's not going to be as simple as what you have said. And I don't want to tell her data. I mean, I know the data, but I, I just think it's unfair for me to say what, what she will have. So I, I, I think uh, Radha's question will probably be solved uh, once you see ILETS data. So ILETS was part of GTEx as well as she's now at Mass Eye and Ear. So who, I just wanted to- who, who is that? What's her last name? Ilet Segre, S-E-G-R-E. -E. Segre, sure. She was, at Broad, she was at Broad Institute earlier and now she's at Mass Eye and Ear. 
Uh -huh. uh, she she has been part of GTEx as well. She has been one of the major authors and developed many methods along these lines. So she's our collaborator on SQTLs. And we have both for peripheral retina as well as macula. And some of that analysis, uh, and, and, and that's why I was saying we do have RPE expression there. Uh, uh, will clarify maybe, hopefully clarify, I don't know hopefully clarify some of the question. But Radha's question is correct. If there is a 10% sort of frequency, you should see a lot of patients with that mutation. And that tells you it's not probably as simple as sim skipping exon three. All right. Okay, well, uh, uh, Chris, do I, can I respond? Is there time to respond? Of course. 9.55, Will. Um, so, Okay, um, yeah, I, I would say we don't know if we would see patients with it, as I said, because we don't know what the, um, you know, what the lower, what, what the threshold is of, of RDH5 activity in order to see, um, see disease. Um, and I look forward to, but I look forward to, yeah, it's great that you guys are doing SQTLs on, um, on you know, on, on adult human, um, I assume autopsy samples. So that's, that's great. That's, that's going to be an important contribution. I would say that uh, the fetal RP, um, it's, yeah, we were worried about variability in the end. Uh, I, I, we didn't see it. Uh, certainly if you ask Dean Bach, he's, he thinks that once you take, you know, 10 weeks or more to differentiate the cells as, um, as we did, that you end up getting uh, thinks, I mean, I'm sure he has data that suggests this, you get rather, uh, you know, a, he, a more uniform, um, quite, quite a uniform uh, phenotype. So I'm not, uh, whereas taking, um, right, uh, autopsy samples, I could imagine you might get, uh, get more variability. So, but you have bigger numbers and bigger numbers can overcome, can overcome all kinds of, uh, overcome all kinds of problems. So I think, uh, I think that'll be, I, I can't wait till um, till you guys publish that stuff. So, um, yeah. Thank you very yeah, much. 20, yep. Actually, we have over twenty homozygous uh, individuals with that variant, and uh, some of them have no retinal disease, whereas some others have AMD at varying stages. So, I think, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. We had a wonderful day again, and uh, greetings to also Stephen.